Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the sanctuary. I'm Professor C, as usual, and we're going to talk about A and P, as usual. Specifically, I'm going to get into passive transport mechanisms. So let's do it. Okay, let's talk about membrane transport. And we have to remember that a membrane is made of a bilayer of phospholipids, which is nearly impenetrable. However, there are some things that can get through the membrane. So we say that a membrane is selectively permeable. Permeable meaning things can pass through it, but there is some sort of selectivity that the membrane chooses who gets through and who doesn't. This is why I've chosen for this particular background image, the velvet rope. So pretend we're at some fancy club and there's a velvet rope and a line of people trying to get in. Some people who have the right characteristics or are dressed just the right way, or they know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody, gets through that velvet rope very easily. And some people, unfortunately, can stand there all night and never ever have a chance of getting inside the fancy club. So the rule is, some molecules can cross the membrane quite easily, others cannot. Although, there's always, you know, your friend gets in and goes around and opens the side door for you and you guys kind of sneak in back there, okay. So there are other ways to get across, if not so straightforwardly. So we're going to learn some rules today about who gets across the membrane and who doesn't. All right, these major transport mechanisms going into and out of cells can be summed up into two categories, either passive or active. And there are some rules to follow. One of those giveaways is ATP. So if you're looking at an image of some sort of cellular transport and you see ATP in the picture, that's probably meaning it's going to be active because ATP is always required. Not just any old energy, cellular energy, ATP energy is required in an active transport. And if you look at the uh, passive mechanism, no, no ATP is required. All right, now energy certainly is required to move anything, but cellular energy, ATP energy is not required. So that's usually a giveaway. If you can see ATP present in the picture, it's probably an active mechanism. Another way of looking at it is talking about a concentration gradient. So I'm going to spell that out right here so we all see it. Concentration gradient. Now, concentration is like you think it is. Uh, if I talk about people are highly concentrated in a city, I think that makes sense to you. It means there's a large amount of people in the city. As you get further and further away from the city, if you're driving out of town, the concentration of people decreases, right? There's a gradient. There's a concentration gradient. There's a lot of people in the city. And as you move out to the suburbs, you get fewer and fewer people. And as you move out into the countryside, you get even fewer and fewer people, right? This is a concentration gradient. It's a gradient from high, a high concentration, to a low concentration. If you're looking at a passive mechanism, looking down here, I'll put a box around it. Substances will move what's called down their gradient. That means that they'll go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Exactly like I was describing in driving out of the city. You're a person in a city. It's highly concentrated with people. You want to get out of the city. You're going to move down your gradient from high to low. Okay, this is the terminology we're going to use in our pictures. In active, we're going to go the opposite. This is not always obvious, but we're going to draw some pictures that make it more obvious. You're going to go against your gradient. You could say you go up your gradient, but that, that doesn't give the struggle that the word against implies. And that's why we need some ATP for this active mechanism, because we're going to go against the gradient, right? We're driving into the city. It's already filled with people. We're going to put more people into it, right? The elevator is already stuffed with people, and we're going to cram more bodies into it. This is going to take some work to get into, to go against our gradient. There are different types of passive mechanisms. Yes, we can make the assumption if we're talking passive, we have no ATP, and substances are moving down their gradient. 
But there are subclasses of these passive mechanisms. The first one is called simple diffusion. And it's called that because, well, quite frankly, it's simple. It's the easiest kind that we can talk about. Diffusion is just a fancy word. Uh, if you've sprayed perfume into a room and it spreads through the room, that's called diffusion. The smell is diffusing because the little particles of perfume that you've squirted out of the bottle are spreading out through the room. Same is true here when you see like maybe food coloring dropped into a beaker of water or something. You put a drop of food coloring, maybe it will, you know, make a trail down as it falls. But if you wait a while, that coloring will diffuse throughout the water equally, right? It will turn the whole water blue color because it's simply diffused throughout the medium. Now you can use those same kind of ideas when you're talking about diffusion on a membrane level, but you have to put the membrane into the picture, right? So we've got this clearly labeled. This is the outside, the ECF, and this is the inside, the ICF, right? Extracellular versus intracellular fluid. I see some particles here. There appears to be quite a bunch of these particles. That's a high concentration. I can count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then down inside the cell, there's a low concentration, right? There's only three of these things. And they're going this way, high to low. And whenever we see particles moving high to low, we automatically scream out. It's passive. It's passive. I also don't see any ATP in the picture. No ATP is present. Again, a symbol that I'm looking at a passive type of mechanism. Well, here we go. Simple diffusion is what you see. Something that's lipid soluble, aka nonpolar, Right? We could say also hydro what? It's going to be afraid of the water. So this is hydrophobic. Okay, so something that's lipid soluble, aka nonpolar, aka hydrophobic, get in free. They get to that velvet rope without any problem. Right? So something that's fatty, lipid soluble, nonpolar, they cross very easily. And that's what it says right here. Nonpolar diffused directly across or small it says or very small for instance oxygen yes oxygen is polar okay fine co2 is nonpolar it gets through no problem water water is definitely polar right it's definitely not nonpolar water is a polar it's our example of a polar it gets through though because it's very very tiny so the rule about who gets in simply, who gets in for free, who gets in first to cross the velvet rope, well, someone who is fatty or someone who is small. Small and fatty particles get in immediately through simple diffusion. Now, are all the particles going to go in? Are all of these particles up here going to go in? The answer is no. They're going to go in until there's no longer a gradient. Right? They're going to keep going in until there's a balance. So this will continue until we are at equilibrium. So I'll write that right here. This will continue until equilibrium. Meaning that it will continue until there are an equal number of particles on both sides, at which point there will no longer be a gradient and nobody will move. Brownian motion is the force that drives this mechanism. Brownian motion is the simple rocking of the universe that we cannot detect uh, with our body. But it does wiggle around particles in space, including particles like this. Problem with it, because Brownian motion is the driving force, it is very slow. Think about perfume wafting through a room. It takes time for that to happen. And it's random, the way that these particles bounce into one another and through the membrane and back again. Okay, so simple diffusion. Particles moving high to low. Small and fatty are the particles that do this. No ATP required. All right, so what if you're bigger? What if you're a bigger particle or you're charged? So the way I usually say this in my classes is if you're large and in charge. So something that's big and charged, like a big polar molecule like glucose. Ions, again, something like a sodium ion and a plus or a potassium ion, these are teeny tiny, but, but they're charged. So they have a problem just diffusing simply. So we're going to have to give them some help. And one of the words for that is facilitation. To facilitate something is to help a 
accomplish something. So we have another type of diffusion here. It's still passive. There's no ATP. Things are still going here from high to low. They're passing through the membrane from high to low, but they're getting some help with a carrier protein, right? And this is the key in a facilitated diffusion. Example is some sort of transport protein allowing those large or charged particles to move through. The binding of the molecule will cause a shape change in that protein, and this will power the transport across the membrane. Remember, there is no ATP in the picture, so even though we do see proteins changing shape, and it looks like it's kind of grabbing somebody and spitting them on the other side, there is no ATP required to do this. The binding of the molecule powers the shape change. The next passive mechanism is called osmosis. It's a special case of diffusion. It is simply the diffusion of water across a membrane. So whenever you hear osmosis, you are limited to the movement of water. And the question that's being asked of you in an osmosis question must be about water crossing a membrane. Other things may be crossing as well, but in most of our systems and osmosis questions, we limit the transport of every other thing except water, and we watch where the water goes. Water concentration is dependent upon particle concentration. And that may sound strange at first, but the idea is going to be that water will go wherever there are more particles. Water is kind of sucked into a system by particles, right? You can imagine some pieces of salt or something sucking in the water across the membrane. Okay, so water concentration is determined by particle concentration. We'll put some terms to this in a moment. The osmotic pressure is the, the sucking force that I just mentioned, this pulling force, pulling water. Again, it's caused by the number of particles, or solutes is maybe a better term for the chunks that are going to be in the solution. When all else fails, do what I used to do back in the day. Just say water follows the particles. Water will go to where the particles are more abundant. It will be sucked into that region wherever there are solutes. Okay, some terms we can use it are, are terms that have to do with tonicity. And again, if we're talking about water moving through osmosis, it's dependent upon the number of particles. So tonicity and variations of the word can help us understand how many particles are in a system, All right? And if you can see here, this is kind of right here what I'd look in the middle and I'd say, that's what a normal red blood cell should look like. They should look like little donuts. And you kind of see that they're hoops with not quite a hole in the center, but it is a lighter colored area in the center there. And they have that donut appearance over here. Instead of donuts, they kind of look all swollen up right? They're swollen. It looks like water has leaked in and made the cell swell up where it doesn't have that donut shape, but it's got kind of a, a, a soccer ball kind of a shape to it or a balloon shape to it, a water balloon, more than a normal red blood cell should. And the other way, if we go the other way, it looks like here that the cells have kind of shriveled up. And you can just use that term if you like it, shrivel. There are other terms we're going to use, perhaps, but we might just be, be able to use swell, swollen, shrivel, shrink, right? So water, if it's going to move in and out of a cell, you can imagine that cell getting bigger or getting smaller depending on how many particles are in the system, right? And this is where these tonic words come into play. So something that we describe as a hypertonic, hyper, of course, means more. Tonic referring to the number of particles. So something that's hypertonic literally just means it has more particles. Okay, and we'll do an example in a moment to put this into our brain better. But just think about the word hypertonic literally means more particles. And then hypotonic is the opposite. Hypo means fewer or less than. Fewer number of particles is something that's hypotonic. There is a word that means equal iso. Many questions on standardized tests do not deal with that term because water is not going to move back and forth. If they have the same number of particles, water is just going to kind of sit there and do nothing. So most of the questions have to do with hyper and hypotonic solutions. So let's check those out with a couple of examples. Okay, so this is my classic bucket of water. 
kind of problem. So imagine we have, and you can kind of draw this so you see, hey, we've got a bucket of water here, and let's set something up so we can learn to use these terms better. <clears throat> let's put a cell in it. There it is. We've dropped a cell into a solution. If you're having trouble with the words, just kind of put that to remember there's the solution, there's the soup, the watery soup, and here's the cell. Okay, now right now we can't tell anything because we have no numbers, but let's think for a little bit. Let's put some particles in the solution, and I'm just doing that by showing a bunch of dots out here. Let's say that it's salt. Let's put some salt in there, and we remember that knackle. Remember that from other talks we did? Sodium chloride is salt. So let's pour some in there. Should start to dissociate and ionize like we talked about in other chapters, but let's just keep it simple here. Let's pour some salt in. Now there is salt inside the cell also. You know, salt there's salt can be found in the cell and outside the cell. So they're not only particles of salt in the solution, but there are particles of salt in the cell as well, as well as other particles. So let's put some numbers to this, right? Let's say something like this. Let's say that there's 2.6% salt in the solution, just to give a number, 2.6. And then let's say that inside the cell, there's 1.7% salt, so less salt, right? Now in this, in this case, salt's going to be our particle. Salt's going to be our solute dissolved in the solution, right? And quite frankly, you just have to look at which number is bigger to determine the region. So 2.6 is larger than 1.7. There are more salt particles in the solution. So this is hypertonic. Literally, there are more particles in that solution than in the cell. Therefore, the cell is hypotonic, right? It has fewer particles relative to the solution. Okay, so now we've set up the terms here, and if you forget the rule, water follows the particles, right? Water goes to where the particles are abundant. Another way of saying that is quite simply, <clears throat> water flows to the hypertonic area. So in this example, water will leave the cell. It will be drawn by the, the, the larger number of particles in the solution will be sucked out through osmotic pressure. And what should happen to the cell? Well, the cell should start to shrink. You may see the word crinate. Crinate referring to shrinking up. Okay, let's do the opposite one. And if you didn't quite catch this, we're just going to do it the opposite way. So let's put the bigger number inside the cell now and see what happens this time. Okay, again, we can put some water or something to show. Here's our cell. Let's bring it back. Now let's say we have, I don't know, some sugar some sugar particles, a solution of sugar. Remind ourselves this is the solution. Is there sugar inside the cell? Of course there is. There's sugar both inside and outside. The question is, where is there more particles? That's what really matters here. Where are there more and where are there fewer? Well, in this example, let's say that there's 1.8% sugar in here. Glucose or whatever you want to make it. Okay, and in the solution, where we also have some sugar, but it's going to be less amount. Let's say it's 1.5% sugar. So both of those, the solution and the cell, have sugar dissolved into them. They have particles in there. They have solutes in there, but there are more particles inside the cell. So now the cell is hypertonic because it has more particles. The solution relative to the cell is hypotonic. Tonic. It has fewer particles. Again, water follows the particles. Water goes to where the particles are numerous or more numerous, right? In this case, all the cases, water flows toward the hypertonic region. And in this drawing, that would be the cell. What should happen if water starts flowing into the cell? Well, it should start to expand and get larger and larger. So we should say something like it will swell. And if the numbers are quite different and water keeps coming in and coming in and coming in, it may even burst. It may break open. The word for this is lice. 
a word that we've seen before in our chemistry section, lyse and lysis referring to something breaking. So this is the opposite idea where the cell has more particles in the solution. So the cell is hypertonic and the water is sucked through the membrane. The osmotic pressure sucks the water in and the, the cell starts to swell and may pop if the difference is too great. Okay, let's look at a curious case real quick called water intoxication. Can you die from drinking too much water? Well, no, of course it's good for you. So, well, no, no, you can. Too much water too fast can cause problems. Let me draw the little picture here to show you. Let's say this is your blood vessels. Okay, here's your blood. And you're drinking water like crazy. You're drinking too much. Maybe you're on the football field, right? And your coach keeps saying, drink, 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 but you don't feel like you need to. And they keep saying, drink, 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 drink. And what you're doing is that water is going to enter your bloodstream fairly quickly. And so if you're just drinking water, chugging water, drinking water, chugging water, you're pouring water into your blood. And it's diluting the blood. It's reducing the number of particles. At least it seems that way because you're filling it with water. So what happens is the blood becomes extremely hypotonic. And it says there right here, the blood becomes extremely hypotonic. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means there are very few particles now relative to the tissue cells that line the blood. So let's pretend these are brain cells. These are just normal brain cells. Your blood is, you know, supplying those brain cells with nourishment, but now it's extremely hypotonic. Well, these particles that are in the brain cells, these normal particles that you find in cells, now all of a sudden they appear to be hypertonic because you flooded your blood with water. And so what happens? Well, water follows the particles. The water will leave the blood and go to the hypertonic area, which now is the brain cells. The brain cells will do what? They'll swell and you'll start to feel funny. And it's at that point you better stop drinking more water. Or you could have the cells pop and you could have a problem like you could fall down and die. And this does happen every year. Think of little kids on the football field where the coach is screaming at them to drink water. At some point, too much is too much. So you could switch it around and start chugging Gatorade, which is full of particles. And you could have the opposite effect, which would dehydrate you, which is why you should never drink Gatorade just for fun. You should only do that if you need that electrolyte solution in your blood. So that's the curious case of water intoxication, extremely hypotonic blood. All right, if you found that talk interesting, check out some other talks. Thanks for watching this one, of course, but there are many more in the series if you'd like to get a little head start. See you next time. Bye-bye.